Hey folks, it's Ard Wolf. Welcome to the Counter Clipping Show for August 8th, 2022. Hopefully you can all hear me loud and clear. I'm hoping that is in fact the case. Um, so we are ready to, uh, what's going on here? Uh, we're having very small technical difficulties. Yep. It looks like we're not getting the social media posts out today. So, oh, well, we're, we're just going to have to make do with the rest of the stuff. And this is Facebook's fault for screwing this up. So and if anybody has any problems hearing me or anything like that, let me know. We should pretty much be, be okay. We are in the new place. Um, we are doing, you know, a, a little less organized stream than normally occurs, which is saying something, right? I don't have the um, the currently clipping or currently drinking cards up right now. We are, curr however, currently drinking um, bourbon on the rocks. It is not a top shelf bourbon, which is why it's on the rocks. Um, however, it so this is benchmark number eight. Let me uh, let me talk about this. So. Yeah, well, we we I threw a bunch in the last hour. I threw a bunch of stuff on the wall back here, so that's why these aren't the final shelves. This is not the final layout. So, so we're going to talk about that, and pretty much nothing that you can't see on camera is is populated behind me at the moment. So, um, so we're not particularly well organized. Mister Fucko says we're not very well focused. Hopefully, hopefully that has fixed itself now. And if we manage to uh, not move around too much, that should revise itself. So we, we should be good to go. So I want to thank everybody for stopping by to the first post-move new studio. So this is not like even the, the place where the recording is going to take place moving forward into the future. Um, it is, in fact, uh, the game room uh, that is going to be the game room moving forward into the future. But this wall behind me will be the wall of shelves. Uh, for the game room, it just won't be these shelves. I think, actually, looking at it, these are, of course, IKEA Calyx is behind me. Um, and they actually fit pretty well into the space. So once we get the last one out of the old house, and I'll talk, I'll talk about that in a bit, um, we will, in fact, uh, we, we might end up going with this particular arrangement on this particular wall. After all, I, got, I have these already. So, you know, that, that presents a opportunity for me to not buy or build new shelves. So uh, a lot of stuff showing up here, not necessarily because I, you know, intentionally decided I was going to show Der Velt Creek, for example, but uh, because this is the stuff I could get to. And it was, you know, I did kind of try and pick some less common stuff, but uh, nothing is terribly buried, but but that doesn't mean that everything is, in this, is necessarily equally easy to get to. So, um, so let's... Before we get go any farther here, so we're on the new internet. Too. What the hell is going on here? Oh, that's why. I figured uh, it was Facebook. Yep. I see what happened. It was Facebook. I switched Facebook profiles and it messed everything up. Anyway, let's say hello to everybody who is watching tonight, starting with... Uh, what are we doing here? Brian Foley, John C., whose birthday it is. Happy birthday, John, 57 years young. Mike Burnett, Captain Asparagus, Charles Latora, Mike Anthony. Uh, we got the, all the early folks here. Daniel Silverthorne, Iggy Cryptal, Dale Brady, Brian Foley. John Longshore is in the house. John Madison is in the house. Rick Cox, Christopher Prest. We're, we're trying to scroll here. Matt Davidson, also in Ohio. Tim Zale, six actual. Carl Crater from the War Game Boot Camp. Tom Borman, William Aarons, William Bird, the legendary fucko, is of course in the house. Chet Bell, Alan Salazar, Krusty Captain, Jeffrey Wesovich, William Aarons, John Clark, Vishka, welcome to the stream. Um, Lee Grant, Brian Gash, Rudy Armendariz, J Jason R. LaRiviere. 
Mark McNair, we yeah, we got to do this off of uh, we got to do this off of um, off of YouTube itself. Ed Holtzman, Doug Sunseth is in the house. Camera is a little askew, so I think that's actually the monitor that it's mounted on, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to try and fix that. BC Games, welcome to the stream. Jeff Beeler, Bobby Factor, Sofa Kings, Ken X or Ken Ten. And I think that I think we got everybody. If I missed anybody, Scott Bell, if I didn't get you, hello and welcome back to the stream. So uh, there is actually a, a divot in the desk surface that the monitor happens to be sitting on. So that is something that I think we will need to fix moving forward in the future. But like I said, this isn't even the place that the desk is going to end up living. So we're going to talk a lot about that. We are, by the way, clipping second front. So I have actually started clipping the most expensive war game I've personally ever bought. So the um, I think, you know, I welcome commentary on the stuff on the shelves behind me. So, uh, you know, including some things that were picked up relatively recently, like Steel Wolves, for example. I actually don't know if these are all infantry divisions. They do appear to all be infantry divisions, um, which does look like, uh, you know, a lot to play, but uh, there are scenarios as well in it. So, and it is kind of a unique uh, thing too, right? Where it covers the entire uh, Battle of the Atlantic pretty much. So Gordon James, welcome and thank you for for the support. It is much appreciated. That reminds me to put the banner on where everybody gets thanked. I had problems with this too, but I'm pretty sure that was Facebook screwing stuff up. So, uh, you know, things are going to change. Right now, though, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm very happy with the way the uh, the new boom arm mount is working. That's going well. But I did reinforce the desktop so that it wouldn't put another hole in it. So so that's working out pretty good so far. So the, the, the move is pretty much complete, pretty much. Um, we took, we expected to be a container and a truck. And what we were is so far as a container, a truck and two SUV loads. And it's going to take another small truck, unfortunately. Um, there's about seven or eight pieces of furniture, which, you know, wouldn't kill me if we threw a couple of those things away. But I don't want to, you know, for the sake of, you know, spending $150 on a truck, I'm not spending more money on more help. So, uh, but there's not that much, right? So the good news is there's not that much. We'll be able to rent a small truck, get the rest of it up here. Uh, everything that's not furniture is basically here, except one critical thing, which is one of our cats who decided that she wasn't getting in the crate to come to the new house. Uh, and she wanted to hide in the basement and we were on a timetable. So this was, uh, yet yeah, we were last there yesterday. Uh, so we have taken the precaution of locking her out of the basement. So we've got one of those little two-way cat doors. So we've locked her out of the basement. So hopefully when I get there tomorrow, she will be accessible. And I'll be able to corral her and throw a laundry basket on top of the trapper and get her in, get her in the crate. Um, so she can come to the new house and live with, with the rest of the family. So that's uh, kind of a big problem. But otherwise, everybody else has made it okay. Um, the dog's doing great. She's very much appreciating having a lot more space than she had before. And the cats who were, you know, four cats in a tiny house, um, not a literal tiny house, but a fairly small house were maybe not getting along as well as they might otherwise. And they are, uh, there's a lot more ability for them to avoid each other now. So, so looking at, um, this is sound this sounds very interesting. When did this occur, I wonder? And uh, and what were the spectacular results from this visit? Uh because Agra Day, welcome back to the chat. If I sound a little tired, by the way, I'm still a little tired. So uh, we slept I slept pretty good last night. So not too bad. So patrons, there was a patrons only video about the uh about the it's like a walk through the yard, by the way. So, so bear that in mind. Uh, I don't normally do Patreon only comment, but uh, content. But this wasn't really content, right? So, and it seemed like uh, the kind of thing that patrons uh, patrons might enjoy uh, getting a peek at. So, a few people have seen that. Um, 
and I, I, I treated myself to a cigar last night. There was a video on that. On video, I actually inhaled and was like, oh, yeah, was smooth. This was great. Yeah. Oh. So that was amusing. So um, the I think what we're talking about in the chat here is the BAR Primer, the Battles of the Age of Reason, which is a series that's kind of a fork off of Labatt um, from Clash of Arms. And unlike, you know, Labatt proper, there's not like 16 million different rule sets to it. So it's it's a lot it's a lot tidier. Let's put it that way. Um, so the uh, lots of folks who who uh, whose patience for Labatt has been exhausted uh, still like uh, Battles of the Age of Reason. And I believe it's basically the same scale. So it's pretty much battalion scale and. Um, offhand, uh, the series covers Seven Years' War stuff. There's a bunch of Frederick the Great stuff and at least uh, some American Revolution stuff. There's uh, Monmouth, for example, is one of the battles covered by BAR, um, which I have the old s and Monmouth, which uses the Wellington's Victory System, uh, oddly enough. And I haven't played it. The on my copy, the counter registration is really, really bad. So um, I'll either have to make counters or if I want to play it or more likely just buy another copy. Um, the well, Battles of the Age of Reason covers, you know, 1750s to pretty much the whole 18th century, pretty much. So there's, you know, a lot of stuff happened in there. You've got, you know, uh, during part of that time, Louis XIV is still around. You've got the, all the Frederick the Great's uh, conflicts. So uh, there's there's a lot of Frederick stuff. Frederick started a bunch of wars, oddly enough. So so there's that. So yeah, John, I I am I'm not really counting on uh, Total War ever actually materializing as a finished product at this point. Um, it's not like anybody's going to give them any more money, right? And the money that they got already is assuredly already, I mean, I'm sure already spent, right? So, so Christopher Prest has been doing videos on Der Weltkrieg, uh, in which I have been watching with interest when time is available. So, so everything is... Uh, it's a, it's a really interesting series. Um, really, it, it's a lot easier to play than a lot of people think. Some people, I know that the weird hexes, the hexide terrain does throw people off. And some people have claimed that it actually makes them sick to, to look at the maps. That I, I'm not saying they're wrong, but that certainly would be an extreme reaction to them. Um, but as far as just kind of getting used to it, eh, it takes you a couple hours of playing it to kind of get used to... Uh, used to the weird hexide terrain but after at that point you're you're pretty much good so i don't know what hr uh, hms grd did with the uh, with the with the europa money but uh it clearly well so, i mean a bunch of it went into producing components right i mean they were not that far away from being done um i think the problem is that they did the maps and did the counters and then then realized that the rules were broken um and at that point some publishers probably would have just said, yeah, well, screw it. People will fix it, you know, aftermarket, uh, which is a thing that happens, right? Um, and they didn't do that. So, but as, as a result, we never actually got a finished game. So. so I wonder how many people just like walk up and show up at their door and ask, where's my, where's my Total War, bitch? So... The Stalingrad 42 expansion is not connected in any respect to Barbarossa Army Group Center. It is, uh, it goes with Stalingrad 42, which is one of the Mark Simonich operational games, uh, which is a very different series than the Vance von Voorhees East Front series. That's true. Just a guard has done some video on uh, Der Weltkrieg as well. So... I now have an ice maker, so you know it's nice to be able to to have ice, uh, which is well. I was actually going to make uh, make uh, old fashions tonight, but I I did not manage to get that put together because that that I like needed stuff for that, and I didn't have the stuff. So all I have is the is the booze. 
I actually sent them an email um, not too long ago, and they didn't answer me. That is an absolute, John, that is an absolutely bizarre story. I, I mean, they probably know those guys, so maybe that's why that actually worked. So I would be shocked that with the answer to the phone, I, I would also be shocked. The, the big, so from, from my reading, and I, I'm not an expert on this field, and uh, a lot of the reading that I, and learning that I have done has dealt with the very tail end of the 1700s, you know, meaning after the French Revolution starts. So, so basically the War of the First Coalition. And it's really there that that there there starts to be a major revolution in warfare from the kind of warfare that that occurred in say say the 1750s. So there is a uh, podcast called uh, the I think it's called the Age of Napoleon uh, that is very good. It is. Uh, starts pretty much with the French Revolution and then segues into Napoleon himself and uh, it does a pretty good job. Uh, it does probably give you more contextual information than say reading uh, um, reading just Chandler Wood, which is a book that's, uh, and I'm talking about Chandler's campaigns in Napoleon. It's very narrowly focused on exactly that, the campaigns of Napoleon. Um, if it didn't happen during the campaigns, um, or if Napoleon wasn't there, then chances are fair that you don't get a lot in that book. That's just not what that book is for. So, so these are just, these are actually the same bookshelves that I had a while ago. Uh, it's just that the one, these weren't what was behind me at the old place where I was filming. So Chandler, the, the, the Chandler volume is excellent. Chandler's, can, uh, David Chandler's The Campaigns of Napoleon is an outstanding book on the campaigns of Napoleon. Highly, highly recommended. Um, the, I guess the, uh, the, the two criticisms that I'll levy against that book are exactly what I just said. Uh, one is that you don't get very much about campaigns that or battles that Napoleon was not personally at. Um, so like, and, and that does hurt in some places. For example, in the Peninsular War, where Napoleon was there, you know, he kind of ordered, hey, go take care of this. It went badly. Napoleon came in there, won a couple of battles, declared victory, and then left, and everything immediately went to pot again. Um, so for, like, you don't get much information on, I mean, he gives you a little bit because you need to know, hey, this is what's going on, but uh, you don't get like anywhere near the level of detail on that stuff that you do on the, you know, say the 1809 Danube campaign. So, a lot of those traditional uh, conflicts got shaken up in the 18th century as well, though. I mean, there's a couple of instances where the British and the French end up on the same side, for example or where Austria and France end up on the same side, even though they are also traditional rivals. I got to make sure the condensation doesn't land on the counters. That would be unfortunate. So, so Doug's not wrong with this comment uh, that uh, most of the wars of the 18th century arose directly out of longstanding conflicts, but uh, that is also the time period on which we started to see a more fluid, uh, uh, set of interlocking alliances in Europe. Uh, John Longshore says, uh, Colonel John R. Elting's Swords Around a Throne, which in his opinion has surpassed Chandler. I'll have to look into that. I've heard of the book. It does have a, uh, a uh, catchy title, after all. I, I think the, interestingly, the um pragmatic war is the war of the austrian succession it's in the uh no peace without spain system i'm looking forward to getting that to a table at some, or really any of those games uh to a table at some point and there's a new one coming um no peace without honor which is campaigns of louis the 14th um which will be interesting to see 
I guess, campaigns of Louis XIV that aren't already covered. So uh, we'll be very interested to see that. I don't know how far we're going to get into Europa tonight. I'm not incredibly motivated. And for that matter, um, I was thinking of actually only going for an hour tonight because I do actually have some other things that I would like to get done this evening. Um, but we'll, we'll see how I feel in about 40 minutes. So, so this is the kind of the premise of, um, you know, or, or part of the premise, at least, of Imperial Struggle, right? Which is a game that I bounced off of a bit. Um, so we'll see, you know, uh, the France did have a, an, an economic foundations of the country were in, in a lot of ways still stuck in the Middle Ages, right? Um, where that was not true of the English. The English had a, a very progressive uh, political and economic system relative to a lot of Europe, but especially to, to, to France specifically in this case, right? So I slept okay last night, but to be honest, I'm still really tired. I was, I was dragging pretty hard today. Today was the first day back to work since the move. So... And, and yes, please hit the like button. Super chats are on and all that stuff. If anybody wants to highlight their question and, and or help support the channel, it is much appreciated. Our uh, prospective buyer on the old place is start, start, sounds like he's starting to get cold feet. So that, that may not be happening as much as uh, I'd like it to happen. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, Spain's much worse. Yes, that that well, Spain was basically had ceased to be a great power at that point by the seventeenth, uh, by the eighteenth century. Uh, Spain at that point is is pretty much not a great power anymore. Where where France still is. So and uh, there is definitely something to the uh, the Spanish pulling all that gold and silver from the Americas in and and basically blowing their economy up with that. So. So that is a thing that is happening. So the room I am in, I don't, I don't have. I, I was, I kind of was trying to get another video done, and that didn't happen. Um, mostly because it's kind of poorly organized right now. The so there's there's a basement which I am currently in. If it sounds super echoey, by the way, it's because there's really you know, the wall behind me is like the only wall with stuff on it. There's like uh, a laminate floor on this floor, so it's it's pretty echoey. I'm gonna do stuff to fix that, including a rug and, and all that. So, uh, so the, the shelves behind me are organized by, I threw it through stuff on the shelves. So I'd have something behind me for the, for tonight's stream is basically the, the truth of it. I mean, I was, I was a little bit organized about it. Like I went out of my way to, to make sure there was like a whole row of compass stuff, for example, which actually stretches farther than you can see, uh, almost the whole shelf. And in fact, if I got all my compass stuff, there's more than this. Uh, I think I would get an entire row of of compass products uh it was not that too, definitely not monsoon and i wasn't that hot today so so i i'm the, the shelves behind me right now are more or less organized by publisher and that is a an organizational system that i tend to use because publishers are tend this there's there's Plenty of exceptions to this, but publishers tend to use uniform box sizes, right? So GMT's box sizes, although the newer ones are just a kind of a tiny bit smaller, um, at, which is a problem in, in some in some cases, but um, but more or less they're the bookcase size boxes, right? Um, the Avalon Hill games. There's basically two Avalon Hill game box sizes that they really three. There's the tiny digest size box, which they did about a half a dozen games, and maybe maybe ten. Um, there's the bookcase box, which came in various thicknesses, but most commonly the two-inch boxes that you see right here. Um, and then they did the flat boxes, right, which were basically the same size as the flat boxes, the one-inch thick flat boxes that, say, GDW used, right? Um, so you really only need to account for Avalon Hill specifically. You really only need to accommodate those two box sizes. And those because the, those flat boxes share a box size, more or less, with... GDW's flat boxes, and for that matter, with Clash of Arms's flat boxes, for the most part, though the um, uh, Clash of Arms 
is weird about box sizes. They've got stuff that's standard bookshelf sizes, and they've got stuff like Triumph of Chaos, which is you know in its own thing. It's got its own unique box size. Um, it, they've used square boxes for things like Legion of Honor, so it's kind of all over the place. Um, so right now, the 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 methodology behind me is pretty much by publisher, and I've I've kept GMT off except for down here, just because. Um, I more or less have GMT all in its own boxes, uh, which is, you know, they're still in boxes, right? So, um, my preference though, aside from that, is to organize in chronological orders. But then you end up with, you know, a big flat box like Alexander, you know, that uh, Alexander from Avalon Hill is, is it goes with the ancient stuff, but all the other ancients is, is all you know, bookshelf boxes, and that, that creates problems. So what I end up doing more often, at the same time, kind of the standard for war games is the bookcase box, right? Um, so as long as we're not talking about weird box sizes, and there's just tons of examples of weird box sizes, right? Even GMT has done weird box sizes. Um, uh, Asia engulfed and Europe engulfed, for example, are in big flat board game style boxes. And um, I don't know that GMT has put anything else in that kind of box. Um, that's just a weird choice. They've done a couple of small digest size boxes, uh, but those are generally for small games, things like Battle Line and that kind of stuff. So, you know, that kind of makes sense. Frankly, they could probably have gotten Maneuver in that size box too, which, but it is in a standard bookcase size box. Car Wars is a weird box size, but that box size is was less unusual back at the time right but but don't forget my it originally came in that little tiny micro uh uh ah, who the hell were those guys um the the mini games boxes right at the, but then the, the version of car wars i have is in a digest size box so um i am not 100 sure i'm pretty sure i can get with the only thing i'm like completely not sure whether I'll be able to get it on these shelves or not is World in Flames. Um, the the trays are no problem. I can easily get the trays on, but the whole big whiff experience, I'm not 100% sure I'm going to be able to get that on. Um, then again, <coughs> the insides of these Calax bookcases <coughs> are 13 by 13 by 13. So... And that will accommodate almost anything. That is, a th you know, a big part of the impetus for, say, the French Revolution is uh, they had a couple of years there with with bad bad winters and or bad harvests, um, and a lot of people died um, via starvation, and that is a recipe for societal unrest, shall we say. So I think this is not the final tray type that I'm going to put these in, but it's going to be in the these the larger um, container store trays. How tall is GMT box? About 11, 11 and a quarter inches usually, 11 and a half maybe. But like I said, since they've they've started doing production in China, they've they've shrunk a little bit. Um, to the point where if you have older GMT counterfeits, you might have trouble fitting them into newer GMT boxes. So, yeah, yeah, it's approximately there. It's approximately twelve inches high. Looking at it, like I said, these are these are thirteen by thirteen. So you've got about an inch and a half or two, almost two inches, um, over overhead room on these Avalon Hill boxes. They're a little shorter than most standard boxes nowadays. Now those white shelves did make it. Um, they are actually, there's a wall right here and they're on the opposite side of that wall. I'm not sure what they're going to be yet. They might just be books. That's a possibility. The old album games, boy, that's a weird format. Um, and the... The old East Front versus new Army Group Center. So yes, they're, they're the boxes are different sizes, so they're they're a little shorter and a little narrower. But that's you know that's something you wouldn't notice without them side by side. But the but the new Army Group Center is also a two and a half inch box, 
Uh, I did an unboxing video where I said it's a three inch box. I was wrong. It's a two and a half inch box. Um, the uh, so and and none of the other games in that series have have had a two and a half inch box. The games in East Front series mostly, if you're very conservative about about uh, tray consumption, you can generally get two counter trays in each of those boxes, and I believe. That's how I've organized basically the entire series. So, now, and there's there are other companies, right? You, so, you've got Flying Pig, for example, that has we weird large box size. You've got uh, Thin Red Line, which has a weird large box size. You've got. Um, and in some cases, the shelves are so tight that, you know, that's a problem, right? Um, the Calaxes, you pretty much don't run into that very much. Um, you can always, of course, shelve the games on their, their sides, right? So I have, for example, Interceptor Ace here on its, on its bottom. You can always do that if you've got narrow shelves. Now, I don't like that. That annoys me because uh, I'm OCD. But it is an option... Uh, for certain things, things with taller boxes, the European, do I have an example? Yeah, I should, I should have an example of, here we go. Yeah. So we can't see them. So here is a compass games box, which is a pretty standard, you know, to within a quarter inch is pretty standard size. Okay. So, and here we have a box from VUCA Simulations. Thank you, VUCA Simulations, for sending me a copy of Donor Schlag, by the way. There'll be a video on this soon. So, comparing them height wise, the Compass Games box is two inches. Now, I'm sure there is there are millimeter me 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 measurements here. The, I don't know how well you can see that, but the Compass box is maybe two millimeters thicker than the VUCA box. It's maybe four millimeters, maybe five millimeters wider. And it's maybe 10 millimeters close to a full centimeter shorter. Okay. So, you know, thank you, weird. Thank you, John, for the, uh, for the, for the support. Much appreciated. Um, so, you know, and that can cause problems if your shelves are exactly sized. So when, when you're working on, you know, bespoke shelving solutions, like building your own shelves, that is a potential problem that you'll want to be aware of. And it is a thing that makes the, the, the Calax bookcases from Ikea very attractive because they're 13 inches tall. Relatively few games are taller than that. Even with, if you turn the box the correct way, I'm pretty sure we'll fit on this thing. I haven't had the chance to test it yet, but... The trouble with the Calax, there, there, there is a downside to the Calax, and it's right here, okay? So you've got these vertical shelves, right? So you're losing, I'd say, a little over, probably five-eighths of an inch every foot, every foot, a little over a foot, okay, to these vertical supports. You're also losing, say, say three inches here where you have to stack the calyxes together, and they only show up in certain sizes, right? There's a there's a one by four, a two by four, a two by two, a three by three, a four by four, and a five by five, and a four four by three. But there's no two by three, right? Um, so you, you're limited size wise. Now it so happens that it looks like they're going to fit almost perfectly in this room. Unfortunately, the the bad news is that the the one that I need, the, the this one that'll go right there actually is the one that's still at the house at, at the old house so I, I can't actually set this up um you also and i haven't done this yet and the only reason i'm getting away with it is because there are war games on these shelves and not rpgs because our war games are relatively light um these things are very sturdy if you bolt them to the wall you mount them to the wall and then they're very sturdy if you don't do that then they're not as sturdy um, so highly recommended to, to attach them to the wall. Now what I will end up doing long-term, assuming I'm going with these shelves, is actually getting two two-by-fours 
bolting that to the wall, screwing it into the studs, and then screwing the cowl axis into the two by fours. Um, that will leave you know an inch and three quarters behind of air space behind the shelving, which is not a bad idea because it's you know we are after all in a basement. Jeff Feeler, thank you so much. I appreciate I appreciate the support. Um, games in stacks is not unusual, <laughs> but I I hate it because to be honest, I've stepped on them before and wrecked stuff and then felt bad about it. So now there are, of course, cheap, you know, cheaper knockoffs from the Calaxes, but these are the, uh, you know, kind of the, the, the best, uh, examples of this style of bookcase. Bob Kowalczyk, thank you so much. Much appreciated for the support. Every little bit helps. Wire shelves. Ugh. Yeah, they tend to create problems with, with shelf wear. However, if, if we're talking about the uh, what I think they are. So uh, the answer on this, Bob, is not yet no. So the war, am I is it showing? Yeah. So this is, I think, a release from the last year or two from Compass. Um, and it's Ernie Copley's design. And I think it is the closest thing we have right now. By it, I mean both the War Europe and the War Pacific. I think it's the closest thing we have right now to a true successor to Avalon Hill's Third Reich. Um, I think that even though the direct successor is GMT is a world at war, GMT is an order of magnitude more complicated than a game that was known when it came out for being pretty complicated. Um, whereas the, the war, Europe and the Pacific are complicated, but they're not totally bananas. Um, so I, I would like to try them. I did, after all, buy the whole thing. So, and if they do another, um, if they do another set, I don't know what, what else they could possibly do, but I could, you know, theoretically, there could be another expansion. Um, we could, I would be happy to buy that as well. So, now you can also, uh, I feel like that'd be a little low. I got to tell you, I think I've got several two by twos and I think that'd be a little low. Um, that's about desk height. If you put a, a, a top on top of two Calyx two by twos, that's about desk height plus or minus an inch. Um, so I, 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 that feels a little low to me. Um, I also thought about building tables, uh, which could still happen, but it's, you know, I don't know if it's going to happen or not. We'll, we'll see. I did remeasure the room here, and I don't think I have the measurements with me. And it's 10 feet, 6 inches, and a, just a little bit of change wide, which is a little wider than I thought it was, which is good uh, because there, that opens up a couple other options on this wall. Um so, John, you've got gamers around you. You just got to connect with them. So, now the uh, and I will say these 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 calyxes are not terribly. I mean, it's been a couple of years since I've actually bought one. These have made a couple of moves for me now, um, but generally speaking, they're not terribly expensive. I think when I looked, I think the five by five, which holds rather a lot of stuff. Um, is was like 129 bucks or something like that. So Mo from Mo's Game Table, thanks for stopping by. I would love to watch that Mo if you can get Ernie to uh, to do it. That'd be great. There was uh, I had talked to Ernie about doing something at Compass last year, and that didn't. Uh, I don't really recall why, but that didn't come together for whatever reason. So. There's always Vassal. I, I prefer face-to-face -to -face too, but there is Vassal. Now that's another problem. I have two Calyx 4x4s, which because of the way you get them, the, you X access this basement, we couldn't get them down here. Now they can be disassembled. So that is a thing that we could consider uh, to get them down here, and uh, that may or may not actually happen. I don't know. Uh, right now, they're in the garage, so. And they're not terribly hard to build. And once you've built one, you, the uh, the other ones go together 
frankly, faster. Now, I will say that because of the extra, you know, this extra airspace that you, you're wasting here, um, you do lose some efficiency, right? Particularly when you're stacking multiple Calaxes together. So, so you should favor a smaller number of larger Calaxes over a larger number of smaller Calaxes. But that, you know, that depends. If you have, you know, you, you want to stack them. So I've got a, this is a three by four. And this is a two by four. This is a two by two. And this is a three by three, because that's what I got down here at the moment. So. So most talking about Rogue One, which is which is a very good movie. Um, Andor looks super promising. I, yeah, I'm, I have not generally been that sweet on the Star Wars shows. I think the Mandalorian is the best of the bunch. Um, the the Andor show looks like it's got a lot of promise. I don't think it's started yet. I, I will tell you that, I guess we'll talk about that a little bit. The One True Flem, welcome back to the stream. Um, and Michael Hett, thanks, uh, thanks a lot. It is not a finished basement. Technically, it's not a finished basement unless there's a bathroom down here, and there's never going to be a bathroom down here. There is, however, a bathroom right at the top of the stairs, which is why there's not going to be a bathroom down here. Um, so, but this particular space is framed. So, uh, I do have, it is, I don't have the measurements in front of me. So this, this is correct to a couple inches. The, um, it's 10 and a half and change by 18 and a half and change. So it's a decent amount of, it's a decent amount of space. It's not quite as, it's not quite a perfect space, right? A perfect space would be about four feet wider um, and about three feet longer uh, for about 15 by 21 or 22 would be basically perfect. That would be a big enough room. And I've done a lot of math to work this out to play any game that I have, um, which includes a number of pretty big things, including, for example, um, Regal's Dare and the Devil's Cauldron or Luck or Atlantic Wall or even Singapore. I could I could fit those on tables in that sized room. Um, whereas unfortunately, um, we we are a little bit shorter than that here. But you know, so what? We, we'll still be able to get now. The, the the big hurdle is that there is an open door frame uh, that we need to get a door into. And I I showed a video of this a few weeks ago, so maybe you could you can't really check that out anymore unless you hunt that down. And I'm not encouraging anybody to do that. So, um, the, so that's got to happen and, and we're, we're going to get some help to do that. Um, I didn't hate solo, but the problem with solo was, I think there were two problems with solo one. There was some really genuinely dumb shit in it. And two, Alden Ehrenreich just didn't sell it. And, and that was that's what really kills that movie. There's a, there's a lot to like in Solo, uh, but unfortunately it doesn't come together as an actual movie. Um, those plasti bands, yeah, those are those are pretty neat. A lot of these, uh, don't forget, there were there were there was a lot of production problems that went, that Rogue One went through as well, and I think you can tell, right? I think. I think there's a better Rogue One, and I liked it. I think I thought it was very good. I think there's a better movie there that that uh, that kind of got a little bit lost in an endless cycle of of rewrites. So, so I was uh, I have only watched the first episode of this so far, and the first episode is pretty good. If you've listened to the, so this is the new Sandman series from Netflix based on the Neil Gaiman DC comics, comic book from years ago, right? And this is, thing's been wrapped up for a long time now. Um, it is a classic comic uh, that I think is never stronger than it is at the for the first 20 or 30 issues. Uh, but even even later, there's some, there's some really strong highlights. Um I've only watched the first episode of the Netflix thing, but I have also listened to most of the, the Amazon uh, audio adaptation with James McAvoy as Morpheus. 
And the Amazon adaptation is absolutely direct, right? It is a word for word audio play adaptation of the comic to the point where it is narrated by Neil Gaiman. The Netflix series, while pretty faithful, is not nearly as direct an adapt. I don't want to say not nearly, but it is not as direct an adaptation. Uh, but I do think it hits all, I mean, from what I've seen so far, it hits all the high points. There's some things that are rearranged in that opening thing. Um, the casting's cool. The visuals are cool. Um, it looks good so far. So, so Brent, thanks for stopping by. Much appreciated. Uh, I don't know that I should spoil folks on this, okay? Maybe I shouldn't. I don't know. Um, and, and this is a problem, right? This is uh, why that whole thing might've been doomed from the beginning is you've got Harrison Ford, who is so iconic as Harrison Ford. Um, and then let alone as Han Solo, you got a kid who's a good actor, but he's just not like quite delivering the, the physical presence and not delivering the dialogue, it, which admittedly is not the greatest dialogue writing job ever but uh but that was also true of the original movie right so we have i have not seen the uh all of uh strange new worlds so i i know they brought a kirk actor in um and i'd pre have preferred not to have seen that i'd really like that show to stand on its own but then again, I don't know how how significant that role is. So, and the Batgirl movie has been up, just, which was mostly done, filmed everything. Michael Keaton, Cameo, all that stuff uh, was just canceled by um, by Warner Brothers. They just decided they weren't, they're not even going to release it. Bob, thank you again. Much appreciated. It is much appreciated. William Boardman is getting ready to watch Babylon 5 again. So Babylon 5 is available on HBO Max, and it is debatably the greatest science fiction television series of all time. Um, it is one of a very small number of, of television programs that I have made it a point to be there. And remember, you know, when it was on, you, there were VCRs then, but... But despite that, I made it a point to be there in front of the TV when it was on, in addition to recording the episodes. Um, so, so the the format of Pacific War that, that we are using to play Pacific War is not a really amenable to uh, live video. Um, we are in right now, let me give you an update on this. We are in right now the Guadalcanal campaign scenario for obvious reasons we didn't play last week. Um, and I think we got probably two more nights of that. Um, and then we're going to play another campaign scenario. So, so it is my intention to do not playthrough content, but a video review of Pacific War, because by that time, it's still probably a couple of months away. Um, but it is, uh, I'm going to have played it enough where I, I will be comfortable with that at that point. Uh, the Expanse is great. Um, Babylon 5 has aged poorly in some ways, but I mean, recognize that it was enormously groundbreaking television. I mean, the fact that you have... Uh, Strange New Worlds is, uh, at least nominally, where it tries to return to an episodic format, is a return to the episodic format that most television, most premium television has gotten away from uh, in favor of arc-based or me meta plot based storytelling, which is a thing that was pioneered, frankly, by there are other predecessors to like the like the um like uh, the 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 fugitive. Uh, but the 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 big uh, pace setter there is Babylon 5, right? There was the first show to even try to do that. And um, to the extent that Deep Space Nine was not a copy of Babylon 5, it then became a copy of Babylon 5 when it decided it wanted to do the big meta plot thing as well. So Firefly is a lot of fun. Um, the Babylon 5 reboot is being worked on by Joe Straczynski, and uh, it was passed 
by the people at Warner Brothers, but then it was kept in development, which is unusual. Um, so we'll see how that turns out. I'm very curious to see it, but we'll 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 see, right? Um, yeah. So this so this is pretty. I, I'm okay with this, right? In, in principle, but the, the episodes have to be standalone. I think I watched the first two or three. And I felt like they were pretty strong, right? Where they weren't strong, they were weak in the ways that Star Trek is traditionally weak. So it felt like Star Trek. Um, so as far as I got, I'm pretty happy with it. But it kind of sounds like they're doing a bunch of fan service type of stuff near the end of the season, which I, I'm less favorable of. Um, I would really like them to stand on their own, right? Um now, a lot of shows, you know, do need a, a year or two or three sometimes to find their feet. Uh, Next Generation was one of them, for example. About two and a half years it took Next Generation, for example. Um, this, I didn't, by the time I was considering watching this, word had gotten out that this was terrible. So, um, I, John has recommended to me this real-time history YouTube channel. It does look good, but I haven't had, I've had relatively little time lately, oddly enough. Obviously, we're going to work on the, the the video framing a little bit here. So, um, one of the problems with Star Trek Discovery is that it is very much the Michael Burnham um, uh, hour, right? Every Star Trek show has been, to some extent, an ensemble show, even in an era where they didn't really do ensemble shows. But at least in the original Star Trek, you got something of that, right? You got... Even a characters that are minor characters like Sulu or Chekhov or, or, or Uhura got to moments to shine. Um, and Discovery has pretty much not done that. Um, and that's and I haven't seen all of Discovery either. I've seen the first two and a half or so seasons of Discovery. Um, and that's irritating. I, I would have preferred to have seen development of some of these characters that superficially look interesting that we never see anything that are like, okay, they're on the bridge. Great. We, we think that's cool, but we, we're never going to develop these characters uh, because it's all about Michael Burnham. And I don't hate Burnham and I, I didn't hate Discovery, but it's got a lot of, it's got a lot of issues uh, narratively and it's got a lot of issues not feeling like Star Trek. I could do a whole episode on this, to, to be honest. So, now Fall of Civilizations, I think, is also, if I'm not mistaken, also a podcast, which I have listened to. Uh, Nerd Workshop, thanks for stopping by. Much appreciated. Uh, this has been a thing for a while. Um, and, you know, as like a future, you know, language evolution thing, I, I think this is not necessarily nonsensical. Um, uh, Kirstie Alley's Savick is referred to as Mr. Savick, too. So, so you know, that's the thing. Um, I thought Enterprise is open, Enterprise opened relatively strong, but I, I do think it, it kind of got lost in the its its own meta plot. And I guess it um, uh, recovered from that toward the end, but by then it was too late. The there are there are oh this is fantastic stuff. Um, there there are things to like about Star Trek Discovery. Um, overall, I think I, I would say it. You know, I'd like to be able to say that if you're a big Star Trek fan, you should watch it. But I'm I'm not convinced that that's actually true. Um, because it in a, in a lot of ways it doesn't feel like Star Trek. It feels like much more like modern non Star Trek sci fi television, right? The Orville feels more like Star Trek than Star Trek Discovery does. Um, and to some extent, that's me being this old you know old fuddy duddy person, and I recognize that. But at, at the same time, you know, Strange New Worlds feels like Star Trek. It feels a lot like Star Trek. I had the same issue with the the J J Abrams movies. By the way, they they did not feel like Star Trek to me. Uh, Michelle Yeoh, I love Michelle Yeoh, and they really don't know what to do with her in that in that show. Uh, to be honest, I um, so there's a couple of these, um, and there's Star Trek continues, and I think Star Trek: The New Voyages, and there's been a couple other things, and those are the two bigger ones. 
Um, and I forget which one is which, to be honest about it, but neither of them quite worked for me in large part because of the performances by the actors. Um, I think the both Zachary Quinto and Ethan uh, Peck are doing a better job than the, those guys did with Spock, for example. No, those aren't, you know, these aren't premium actors necessarily. Uh, Ethan Peck is literally Gregory Peck's grandson. So um, Crouchy Tiger, Hidden Dragon is a fabulous movie, by the way. You know, though, this is this is a very Star Trek thing, right? So it, it is very Star Trek for this uh, as a one-shot thing to occur. So I have no real issue with that. Um, see, I, I'm hearing... I, I haven't watched Orville Season 3. I haven't watched... I think I watched Season 1. Um, I'm hearing uh, other people say that uh, the season... The end of the season of Orville Season 3 was amazing. So... Now, like I said, I've watched about two and a half seasons of um, Discovery, and I kind of, kind of just got tired of dealing with it. I, I like Zachary Quinto as, as Spock too. I think he was an inspired choice. It was, you know, a sort of a, a, a nice thing that that it sort of worked out that this young actor came to prominence right around the time that they were recasting Star Trek. And he turned out to be an ideal choice, but I think Ethan Peck is doing just as well. So I believe that uh, you probably aren't alone in the preferring Star Trek four, but I think I, I'm with the the crowd on this one where I think two is the best one. I think it pretty much runs two, six, four, and then the other, and then one, uh, oddly enough, uh, of the original series cast. The star, I didn't, hate um oh what was the other one there were there were four um next gen movies there was generations which was okay i mean it kind of had a job to do and it kind of did it sort of um it had some memorable things in it there was first contact which was great it's universally considered to be the best of the the next gen movies there was the there was nemesis which is an absolute pile of dog shit um, and then there was the other one that that I can't remember the name of, which was where they go to the planet with the immortals, the, with the with the with the fountain of youth, which I thought was okay. It was it was a decent episode. It was a decent I I, I said episode because it feels like an episode of the TV show. It, it really does. It doesn't feel like a theatrical film. It feels like an episode of the TV show, but it feels like an, a fairly decent episode of the TV show. So it totally works for me. Daniel Barney, thank you so much. Much appreciated the support. Um, it really does help. Um, the I think Star Trek the motion picture is underrated, to be honest. Um, it is slow. I, I'm no, nobody I think is going to design des, uh, is going to deny that it is slow. Star Trek Insurrection, yeah, and I liked that one. I thought that was very good. Um, So if I haven't said this, The Expanse has been mentioned in the chat. The Expanse is fantastic. Watch The Expanse. Um, it is on Amazon Prime. So it just gets better as it goes. It's 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 good in the first season. It's better in the second season. It's even better in the third season. And by like seasons four and five and six, and it's like, wow, this is like the best, some of the best science fiction to ever appear on television. Uh, very, very much... Uh, it's right there with Babylon 5, if you ask me. And except it's not, a, there are some respects in which Babylon 5 feels super dated. I think it still holds up fairly well. Uh, and I'm not just talking about the effects. Uh, there are reasons why, so they didn't, there's some problems mastering the effects to DVD. Let me put it that way. Without giving you the details, then I'm probably going to misstate. Um, so the, the effects, especially in the early Babylon 5 seasons on DVD are kind of garbage. Um, some of that was cleaned up for the HBO Max release. So, so that's good. Uh, the Klingon theme from the Jerry Goldsmith Klingon theme, which has been reused all over the place, including in the shows and, it, you know, all over the place. So the, the, the standout character uh, of the book for me, the, the first book and really the first two book is Joe Miller. Um, the, 
the way the first book was written is, of course, if you don't know, James S. A. Corey is a pseudonym for two of. Oh Jesus, they're back. Um, is a pseudonym for uh, Daniel Abraham and Ty Frank, and Abraham of the two is the more experienced was when they came in the more experienced author. And Daniel Abraham wrote Joe Miller, and Ty Frank wrote um, um, uh, Holden. And you could tell, right, the, the Joe Miller stuff. And, and maybe that's because it's an easier hook because he's like a noir detective on a on series, right? Um, is it's it just it I just thought it was catchier, I thought it was smoother, I thought it was just it flowed better. Um, by the second or third book, I stopped being able to tell the difference between who was right and who. Um, so uh you know, it was just one of those things. The Klingon captain in Star Trek One was Mark Leonard, who played Sarek. I don't recall that he was in Back to the Future. There is a um, there is a sort of first. One of the weird things that that happens in the Expanse's adaptation is that you don't get to the climax of the first book until about midway through season two. Um, and the first couple of seasons are kind of like slightly off in that respect. And they eventually kind of resynchronize. Uh, but that is a thing that you kind of got to just deal with in the first season or two. So Christopher Plummer, you think of Christopher Lloyd, that was the Klingon captain from Star Trek three. Uh, whose name I don't remember. Pretty good Klingon, by the way, Christopher Lloyd. I don't know that this is really true. Uh, I mean, sort of. You can kind of see it, but I think I think it'd be easy to take this um, analogy too far. Let me put it that way. I think I didn't remember that, but yes. I mean, it it Star Trek the Motion Picture does try to be more than just a Star Trek movie, right? And and I don't know that it completely succeeds. Um so and and I, I don't doubt that this is true, but but uh, I think it's it's structurally fairly subtle. Um, so, like I said, I think it would be easy to draw inappropriate conclusions from this statement. Well, well, well. Not, I'm not denying that that's true. Um, it's uh, it's it's relatively subtle. Let me put it that way. It feels Rome is fantastic. Uh, that you could really tell that they, they had more seasons in mind and the, the money ran out because it was horrifically expensive to produce, even though HBO wasn't paying, wasn't putting the entire bill themselves. So they canceled it after two seasons. And they, they put about two or three seasons of stuff in that second season. And as Chris Dodd points out, Christopher Plummer was the was the guy from Star the main Klingon adversary from Star Trek Six, uh, General Chang. So with the eye patch bolted to his head. So and apparently they uh, Christopher Plummer and Shatner were you know had history. So so that was a thing that was happening. I would love to see Star Trek the Motion Picture in the theater, actually. Uh, I am... So Matt Taylor says that the worst Star Trek movie is Star Trek V, The Final Frontier. And there was a time when I would have agreed with that. Uh, but I think Star Trek Nemesis is actually probably worse. Um, it's really bad. Uh, and while Star Trek V is pretty bad um 
it at least has some cool stuff in it. I don't think there's anything cool in Star Trek in in Star Trek Nemesis. Um, there's a lot of dumb stuff in Star Trek Five. I mean, to to be fair, um, but it also would have fit right in as an episode of the show where they go to the center of the galaxy and meet God. I mean, that would have fit right in. So Band of Brothers does hold up exceptionally well. I I agree with Lee Grant here. Uh, the Pacific, I need to watch again. I've watched Band of Brothers multiple times. I've only watched The Pacific once. Uh, Christopher Plummer was in The Sound of Music, yes. Yeah, I think there's so something like this. I forget the exact details. I need to watch Generation War as well. So that is on the, or Generation Kill, yeah. Uh, that is on the list of of, uh, of things to do. So. So we're, we're not feeling super organized here tonight. So I think we are going to um, call it, holy cow. I think we're going to call the evening early, folks. Um, so, and Christopher Plummer was Wellington. He was a very good Wellington, although Wellington has very little to do in that film. Um, I think he's kind of wasted in that, to be honest. Um, that is unfortunate. Um So I think we're going to call it early tonight, folks. I've got some stuff to do. I got a bed to put together, um, and we're having a lot, uh, a lot of stuff going on. Um, I see people playing that Star Star. There's a, oh, I forget which one it is. There is a Star Trek board game that I see people playing at conventions. And uh, Christopher Plummer was Commodus in Rise of, uh, in Fall of the Roman Empire uh, with Alec Guinness as Marcus Aurelius, if I'm not mistaken. So, um, yep, let's let's call it a night. We will be back next Monday uh, with a full show. So, and hopefully, we will be a slightly better organized at that time and a little more alert, frankly. So um, I would like to thank everybody for stopping by. I'd like to thank everybody for the, you know, the extra support, well wishes and all that stuff. Um, and we'll see all. Uh, so we'll be on the show with Dan tomorrow as well. Um, that may be a goofy thing where I, I, I don't know how it's going to work, but, but we are still planning. Star Trek Ascendancy, that is the game I'm thinking of. Uh, we will be on the show uh, uh, tomorrow night with Dan one way or the other. So I'd like to wish everybody a great night. Uh, let's hope the cat thing works out and we'll see you all again soon.